Be here now. Just be here now. When we feel more connected to the soul, we might actually feel more connected to our family, to community, to nature, to God. Because what is the soul if not this piece of shared divinity that's sort of been fractalized throughout every sort of human individual being? Welcome to the Be Here Now guest podcast. This series features a collection of teachings and conversations centered around mindfulness, spiritual growth, and living a life in balance. Each week, our diverse network of guest teachers and hosts offer up wisdom and practices from a different spiritual path and perspective. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash donate. Welcome, everyone, to another Ramdas Fellowship live stream. Here we are. We're having interesting conversations with wisdom keepers of our time as we deepen into topics that were near and dear to Ramdas's heart. I'm Jacqueline Dobrinska. I'm the community, I'm the director of community outreach and education for the Love Serve Remember Foundation. And all of you here, you are the Ramdas Satsang, that sacred community that's made up of folks from all over the world. And we come together in various ways each month, including the, these live streams, to feed our hearts and our minds and our souls and to remember the deeper truths because they can be so easy to forget in these times and to dig deeper into the teachings of Ram Dass and Neem Karoli Baba. So tonight, very excited to be here with Madison Margolin. Uh, We're gonna be talking about psychedelics, mysticism, and religion. I'm just gonna give you a quick outline of how tonight will work in case you haven't been here before. It'll be about 75 minutes. The first half will be Madison talking about these topics. And then the second half is an audience Q and A. Um, The way that we do this is that at any point during this evening, you can type into the chat any of your questions. We have the lovely Gina on the back end who's watching all of those streams and she'll feed me the questions and then I'll ask them to Madison. Uh, We'll try to answer as many as we can. So I just invite you all now to settle into your space to sort of get out of the momentum of your day and just take a couple of nice, big, deep cleansing breaths and feel into your body, feel your toes and your fingers and feel this field of people around the world who are connected to these teachings, connected to this wisdom, all of those hearts like lights that create a web of connection that loving awareness moving through those connections and in each of our hearts. And as we breathe into that space together, we will welcome Madison. Um, If you don't know her, she has a long history with Ram Dass and his teachings, having grown up in the Maharaji Satsang, where Ram Dass was a close, family friend of her father, Bruce, who is a criminal defense lawyer. He represented Timothy Leary and campaigned to legalize cannabis. She co-founded a publication called Double Blind, and it highlights stories using psychedelics as a starting point to explore mental health, social equity, environmental justice, and spirituality. And she's written for Rolling Stones and Playboy and Vice and others. Um, She is also the host of Set and Setting, which is a new podcast on the Be Here Now Network. So from our loving, present hearts, let's all shine a warm welcome through the ethers to Madison um, as she shares about psychedelics, mysticism, and religion. Welcome, Madison. So glad you're here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, this is really a special opportunity and just means so much to me, like from my heart, like like you said in the bio, kind of that I grew up with Ram Dass, um, really would never have thought that I'd be participating in any sort of Be Here Now network um, activities. So yeah, I just, first of all, I wanna thank Jackie, Raghu, um, Corey, more people at the Be Here Now network and Love Serve Remember, um, who just been really supportive um, the past few months um, when I launched Set and Setting podcast and also gave me the opportunity to present here today. Um, and so, 
Yeah, I want to say that it, it feels a little bit ironic, um, especially because there was a time in my life where I sort of rebelled against Ram Dass. Um, you know, but being that Be Here Now was such sort of a household staple um, where I grew up. Um, a lot of my life, I wasn't really here and now. I struggled to be present. I dissociated. Um, so it's been really a personal practice, um, both religiously, psychedelically, and I'll, I'll get into it. Um, so most people have stories about discovering Ram Dass and his work, you know, how he opened them up to enlightenment, um, brought them to tears in his presence, inspired them to embark on a path of mindfulness. Um, and I'm going to open with a story about how Ram Dass uh, gave me the middle finger when I was 16 years old. Um, and so I know this is a talk about religion, mysticism, psychedelics, and I'll be sure to sort of bring it all around. Um, but you'll kind of see through this anecdote. So this was a family trip. Um, my mom brought me and my younger brother to Hawaii on one of these sort of well-intentioned but miserable, chaotic uh, family excursions together. And everyone was fighting. And I was going through a phase where I would scratch my face with my middle finger. And um, that would be my way of being rude to my mother, um, one-upping her or whatever. And so we went to visit Ram Dass and you know, being that he has a background in psychology, she sort of laid all of her problems out on him um, and tried to use him as a therapist and told him all about how rude I was and this and that. And I remember he kind of just sat there and he was quiet and he listened and he kind of like shrugged it off. It's just like mother daughter fetching with each other. Um, and at the end of the visit, he waved goodbye to me and in the stroke of his hand kind of scratched his cheek with his middle finger. Um, and I got, I was really shy and embarrassed and, you know, it was, it was sort of the, the reason I think this is a psychedelic story is that in one foul yet gentle swoop, Ram Dass kind of completely threw off my ego, right? Like here I was this teenager puffed up chest, angsty. I needed to be right. I needed to one up my poor mother who I think she's in the audience. So love you. Um, and thank you for everything. Um, <clears throat> And Ram Dass kind of just like brought my brought down my ego a little bit. And I think that's really the essence of like what a psychedelic experience does. Um, so, you know, I want to start with some defining terms here. So what, you know, when we use the word psychedelic, what do we mean exactly? Um, you know, for me, it's not really just trippy visuals or intense out of body experiences, though, of course, it can be. Um, but really, I'm talking more about the results of having had a psychedelic experience. And that's sort of this dampening of the ego in favor of a reconnection and strengthened connection um, uh, with or of the soul. Um, and so when we feel more connected to the soul, um, we might actually feel more connected to our family, to community, to nature, to God. Because what the soul, what is the soul if not this piece of shared divinity that's sort of been fractalized throughout every sort of human, you know, individual being? Um, I kind of think of it as like, you know, you think of this fire throughout, you know, this kind of spiritual fire of the universe. And then, you know, fire can, is also just like an individual flame. And that relates to like the greater thing. So, you know, that's kind of what we're talking about when we see those bumper stickers that say all one or you read the Dr. Bronner's magic soap bottle, and it says all one or none. Um, but anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Here's a little introduction. Um, so why am I qualified to speak on the topics of psychedelics, mysticism, religion? Um, I'll also say that a lot of my talk here, I'm going to be speaking from personal experience. So this isn't meant to focus on like one particular religion. I'm just kind of using that as an example because that's that's what I know and that's where I come from. So I just want to use that as a preface. Um, so, okay, I'm a journalist. Um, my focus has been on the overlap between Judaism and psychedelics. Um, and so the interest is personal. Um, I started taking psychedelics when I was 18. Um, when I was a freshman at Berkeley, I actually wrote my first research paper of my first semester on psychedelics before I'd ever even tried them. Um, and of course, I was inspired by the psychedelic path, um, thanks to Ram Dass, Timothy Leary, um, and having grown up in this community, the satsang, um, you know, my dad was with Maharaji in the 70s. Um, you know, there was always an eclectic cast of characters coming through the house, and all of these people had been influenced by psychedelics themselves. And so 
I was, you know, always asking myself, like, you know, and first it was really embarrassing, of course, like we were, you know, and I just wanted my parents to be like everyone else's parents. And of course, nowadays I am really proud of where I come from and how weird it is. Um, and I say that endearingly and with all positivity. Um, and, and so, yeah, a lot of, so, you know, a lot of my research really began as this homage to um, the Richard Alpert inside Ram Dass, um, to this sort of like nice Jewish boy and psychedelic researcher at Harvard, um, who ultimately found religion and to the Hindu really. And that's, that's what Ram Dass has said to me himself personally, um, you know, through um, seeing through what I'll call the sort of post psychedelic path. Um, you know, psychedelics ultimately set him on a path of connecting with God, um, which, you know, that sort of spiritual cosmic divine connection, I would argue is just as or more psychedelic itself um, than simply getting high on acid or whatever it might be. Um, in the words of my satsang uncle, uh, Mohan Baum, I don't know if he's in the audience, but I um, I remember I had gone to uh, to Goa a few years ago and I was just like asking him about acid and just trying to sort of half interview him, but really just wanted to hang out. Um, and he said something about, you know, people are just getting high on acid nowadays. They're not really having psychedelic experiences. And so, you know, what I really want to emphasize is there is a difference between getting high and having a psychedelic experience. Um, and, you know, I think relating to what I was talking about previously with like this whole diminishment of the ego, um, that is psychedelic versus just like having a fun trippy time, which is all great and everything, but I, you know, there's just a difference of defining our terms. Um, so you can get high on something that could produce a psychedelic experience. And by the same token, you can have a psychedelic experience without having to take a substance. Um, so going back now, when I was in journalism school, um, I was in a reporting class, a reporting 101. It was, you know, the first class of, of the program and everyone had to report on an ethnic community. So Puerto Ricans, Russians, whatever. I was the only Jew in the class. Um, so I was given the nearly impossible assignment of reporting on Brooklyn's Hasidic community, um, which is probably the most insular um, religious community in America. Um, it's basically an autonomous zone, like Yiddish is the primary language. They have their own school systems, their own ambulance system. You know, the internet is limited. It's like, even for me as a Jewish person, like going in there, like I'm not, there's no, it's really hard access. Um, so I got dressed up. <laughs> I wore a long skirt and all of that. And I um, went up and down the main drag in in Williamsburg. That's uh, Lee Avenue, buying all sorts of rugelach and, rugelach and other kosher pastries, trying to spark conversation with someone behind the counter to, you know, get a story for this class. And eventually I met a kid who was working at a pizza shop and he was sort of off of the more like austere religious path um, and spent his weekends doing like boatloads of psychedelics from acid to MDMA to ketamine to shrooms at Psytrans festivals in upstate New York. And, you know, I was sort of just blown away, you know, like this kid came from a black hat background and here he was like more experienced with psychedelics than any burner or, you know, hippie I'd ever met really. Um, and so it really got me thinking, um, you know, if he had been through enough psychedelic trips, which it seemed like he had been, you know, I, I, I hypothesized at one point or another, he might reckon with religion. Like, how are you not primed coming from this kind of orientation to have that not factor into your psychedelic experiences? And so what I've noticed is this sort of coming together, this meeting in the psychedelic middle of people who are both looking for spirituality and got onto that more religious path like Ram Dass and a lot of the satsang through first taking psychedelics and then kind of practicing, studying sadhana and like religious practice and ritual and like sort of the mundane stuff. And then from the other perspective, people who come from more, um, you know, regular observant religious uh, backgrounds who wanted to reconcile their relationship to religion um, and who've tried psychedelics. And what a lot of them have told me was that upon uh, trying acid or shrooms or whatever it might be, that it really brought them back to the experiential perspective of the essence of the religion. You know, people have said to me in my reporting, you know, when I first tried acid, um, I finally understood what 
the Baal Shem Tov was talking about. The Baal Shem Tov is the father of the Hasidic movement, um, and really he encouraged this unmediated direct connection to God, that anyone really could have that relationship. It didn't have to be mediated by a rabbi or doing all sorts of fancy religious rituals. You could just talk to God. Um, and that was revolutionary, especially at a time when, you know, Judaism of, um, you know, Europe in the 1600s was, you know, very Christianized, austere, academic, not ecstatic, not about dancing and singing and clapping your hands. It was more bookish. And so this was really the, the heart of it. Um, and, you know, again, a lot of Jewish practice at the time was sort of divorced from its shamanic earth-based roots that are more akin to an indigenous tribal tradition than, you know, the form of religion that we're potentially more familiar with today. So, again, I'm just saying this because of these are exemplary purposes. Um, but another thing that this causes, the reason um, we ended up with this form of religion, of the way Judaism looks or looked, um, was because of anti-Semitism, um, which all, all this persecution really forced a type of assimilation and a suppression of the more kind of woo-woo practices that would have kind of gotten people in trouble. Um, so that in an effort to survive, uh, the religion had changed shape. So the reason I say this is because there's no way to talk about psychedelic healing without mentioning trauma. And so it can be, you know, when we talk about trauma, we talk about both the experiences that we've had in our own bodies and also coming from a genetic lineage. And so the whole concept of epigenetics is that um, the experiences of our ancestors don't change the DNA itself, but they can change the way the DNA, the DNA functions. So, um, and that could come off as, you know, hypervigilance or anxiety or, you know, an inability to sort of stay in one place for too long or whatever it might be. And this is, you know, across all sorts of ethnic groups and really everyone, everyone in the world, I'm sure has some sort of inherited trauma and lived, lived experience trauma, but, you know, Jewish, African-American, Native American, stuff like that. And, you know, one might argue also that trauma is at the root of other ailments too, whether that's anxiety, depression, and physical or somatic conditions. Um, so, okay, why are psychedelics so healing? Um, you know, I personally believe that they're, they serve the very necessary role of blurring the lines between the medicinal and the spiritual, the recreational, and the therapeutic. Um, so I want to just take a moment to orient the audience um, who might be less familiar with where we're at in the psychedelic renaissance today, quote unquote. Um, Ram Dass and Timothy Leary, or back then Richard Alpert, um, were among the original cohort of Western researchers looking at psychedelics namely LSD and psilocybin, until Harvard expelled them. Um, and then eventually Nixon launched the drug war in 1979, trampled on, um, except MDMA, which was later made illegal in the 80s, right before Rick Doblin founded MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, currently, researchers at institutions like Johns Hopkins or NYU are looking at psychedelics for the treatment of conditions like anxiety, depression, um, addiction, and MAPS is looking at MDMA specifically for PTSD. And there's other research that looks at ayahuasca and, um, and LSD and DMT and whatever else um, for other indications. So really like where we're at is that MDMA and psilocybin are on the FDA fast track to become approved medications and psychotherapy early this decade. Um, well, also, jurisdictions around the country have decriminalized psilocybin and or other naturally occurring psychedelics um, or potentially decriminalized all drugs in general, like we saw in Oregon in the 2020 election. Um, so that's just kind of where we're at. But, you know, what's funny is that people need kind of Western science to validate things that have been known for so long. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but there's one study in particular that I want to focus on, which is looks at religious professionals um, who are taking psilocybin. And, you know, so that includes rabbis, priests, imams. Um, and the idea of the study is to understand the mystical nature of psychedelics. Um, and, you know, these, these particular um, study subjects technically should have um, a better vocabulary with which to talk about mysticism because of their profession. Um, so scientists have qualified a quote-unquote mystical experience 
according to seven criteria. Um, so the first is um, a feeling of internal unity, a loss of your visual identity, um, freedom from the limitations of your personal self and feeling a unity or bond with what was felt to be greater than your personal self, an experience of pure being and pure awareness, experience of oneness in relation to an inner world within, um, fusion of your personal self into a larger whole, um, experience of unity with ultimate reality. Um, the second uh, criteria is external unity. So this insight that all is one, it's sort of you, you know, you see someone else and you are them almost, you know, the lines between you and something else disappear. Um, you know, and you also see your surroundings more intensely. Um, and then, you know, this feeling as all of it is just one. Um, the third is transcendence of time and space. Um, somewhat self-explanatory, I guess. Um, you know, time doesn't feel as it is. You lose your, you, you lose your, usual sense of time and space, where you are, past, present, future, you kind of feel outside of that regular mundane paradigm. Um, there's no boundaries, there's timelessness. Um, and then the sixth, uh, sorry, the fourth um, criteria is an ineffability and paradoxicality. So an, in an inability to describe the experience adequately with words. Um, you know, an experience of a paradoxical awareness that two opposite principles or situations are both true. Um, and that in order to describe the experience, you have to sort of use illogical contradicts, contradicting paradoxes. The fifth is a sense of sacredness, reverence, uh, spiritual height, profound humility before the majesty of what was felt to be holy or sacred, um, a sense of awe or awesomeness. Um, the sixth is a noetic quality. A feeling that the consciousness experienced during part of the session was, quote, like more real than your normal awareness of everyday reality. Um, you know, it's sort of an encounter with ultimate reality um, that you kind of know at an intuitive level. And the seventh is deeply felt positive mood. So experience of ecstasy, exaltation, universal or infinite love, joy, tenderness, peace, tranquility, overflowing energy. So that is, according to the science, um, or the scientists, uh, both, you know, and they got a lot of that, of course, has been influenced by the way mystics and, you know, religious philosophers and whatever have described mysticism throughout, like, the generations, essentially. Um, so, you know, going back, like I said, tribes in places like the Amazon have known, have shown us for generations that the spiritual and emotional and psychedelic healing are often one and the same. Um, psychedelics can help us feel connected to the world around us and ourselves, to nature, community, cosmos, other people, God, whatever. And it's the feeling of connection, of being held in a cradle of the universe that puts us into the parasympathetic state of the nervous system, um, which is the opposite of the sympathetic state of the nervous system. So in para, you're in a state of rest and relaxation and repair, which is literally healthy for you, which is the mechanism that which you're going to heal from both physical issues as well as, you know, mental and emotional. Um, whereas sympathetic is, you know, fight or flight, it's kind of the, the trauma state. Um, I also want to point out that psychedelics don't always put us in para, but they can, of course, um, as can meditation, dance, yoga, sex, prayer, you know, all these other modalities. Um, which are just kind of ways of connecting to the soul, I would say. Um, if you wanna learn more about this, I highly recommend Julie Holland's book, Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. She's just an incredible um, psychedelic, uh, uh, psychedelic, pro-psychedelic psych psychiatrist. Um, and you know, another thing that's relevant here is um, something that Gabor Mate has said is that um, a lot of, um, at the core of a lot of our mental health issues, addiction, especially trauma, is this feeling of being alone. Um, and so when we're kind of more connected to mysticism, we're, we, we are never alone, right? Like if, if God is in the room, and I don't wanna use the word God because not everyone believes or that's, that's not the language that you wanna hear, but you know, there's this feeling of connection to everything else. And so that sort of alleviates this feeling of isolation and lonesomeness. So 
Um, in a 14 month follow up to the study that I just spoke about, over half the participants rated the experience as among the top five most meaningful spiritual experiences in their lives and considered it to have increased their personal well being and life satisfaction. Uh, which makes sense. Um, Albert Hoffman, the Swiss chemist who first synthesized LSD, called it medicine for the soul, which I think can be used to describe other psychedelics as well. Um, and the point is that soul relaxation that psychedelics give us can, like I said, help put us into a state of parasympathetic. And especially if we integrate those experiences into our everyday lives, um, start doing yoga, meditating and whatever, you know, that's kind of a way to harness that healing. So again, it's not really just, and like Ram Dass had struggled with this himself, it's not about just getting high, feeling good and coming down, but how can we really harness the psychedelic state the state of our both our bodies, our minds, souls, um, and remember it, you know, with remember it with our bodies. And I and that's really where embodied practice comes in. Um, you know, to and you know, our bodies remember trauma, and I think our bodies can also remember what it feels like to feel healthy and connected and spiritually aligned. Um, and so there's a correlation between healing and mysticism. And which I like to say puts psychedelics at the intersection of God, science, and policy. Um, because if there's a correlation between healing and mysticism in these clinical trials that are showing success, then ultimately then mysticism could potentially be seen as playing a part in in the way that people start to recognize medicine. And that's ultimately going to lead to a shift in federal law around psychedelics as medicine. So you know, just stay tuned over the next couple of years, I guess. Um, when we talk about mysticism, um, we're also talking about what, you know, Aldous Huxley referred to a lot, which was perennialism. Um, and again, this isn't necessarily psychedelic, um, engendered by psychedelic or not, um, but it's the idea that at the core of all religions, the core of all religions is the same. You know, you kind of get to this post-religious, trans-religious experience, and it's just sort of that oneness that we talked about, this kind of shared feeling of mysticism or me metaphysical truth or origin. Um, so when I first read Heaven and Hell, um, which is this addendum to Huxley's essay, The Doors of Perception, um, he talked about these glittering temples from around the world and how they all share these psychedelic, geometric, universal quality to them, whether they were in India or in Mexico or whatever. And I think that really, even just the way that places of worship have similarities aesthetically kind of speaks to what we're talking about. Um, and that's because ultimately I would say that mysticism is agnostic or universal. Um, according to the research of Rick Strassman, who was the first person to get FDA approval to study DMT, um, which is also the main uh, component of Iowa, or the main psychoactive component in ayahuasca, um, people, humans, have an innate and unique capacity to communicate with the divine, um, with you know, with a collective or universal consciousness that sort of permeates the world. And so Strassman's research looks specifically at instances of prophecy throughout the Hebrew Bible, um, relating the relating the prophetic brain state um, with that of the DMT brain state. Um, and if I had time, I would go into how DMT was actually part of the early Hebrew tribal tradition and was integral to certain rituals and practices. Um, and again, that relates to sort of how Judaism started out as this earth-based tradition with attention paid to the four directions and the winds and the lunar calendar and the agricultural seasons. And that was the essence of the religion more than like, you know, everything that developed after that. Um, and so, um, like I was saying earlier, you know, it was, it's sort of on account of trauma, I think, going relating back to sort of my own story and where I'm coming from. You know, I always wondered, like, what was it that people, Ram Dass, my parents, their friends, um, were looking for in Hinduism, in psychedelics, and Burning Man, in Buddhism, and Rainbow Gathering, and whatever it was that they that wasn't quote unquote available within Judaism, um, or maybe they just didn't want to look there. You know, what, whether you know, for my dad especially, he he was a child during the Holocaust. Um, he was still he was in America, but he told me that he remembers thinking to himself what's wrong with, with us? Like, what's wrong with me that, that so many people want to kill us? And so I think that was like a little bit of a turnoff um, to kind of looking inside the place where you come from. And it's a form of trauma where, 
if you define trauma as sort of a disintegration of self, um, healing is sort of a reintegration and coming back together. So what I ultimately want to get to, though, is when we talk about like Hinduism or any sort of um, looking into another religion to find that that spiritual core, that that is perennialism. And I think that's really what what this kind of community speaks to is that so many people were able to really turn on, you know, tune, on, tune in, turn on, you know, Timothy Leary was tune, on, tune in, turn on, drop out. But really they were like through all of these different religious paths, they were really getting to that core one place of oneness. Um, and for me, um, you know, what led me, what led me to psychedelics and back again um, was sort of my own um, relationship to trying to like, navigate these different religious paths that were in front of me um, and not really knowing how to make sense of them. I was doing yoga and, and really what I found to be the most spiritual moments in my life, um, at least up until college time was yoga and jogging. Um, and I remember when I was writing my essays um, for college admissions and like describing why these things were important to me it was that i had been struggling with a pretty bad eating disorder and you know what yoga and jogging gave me um was this focus on the breath and so you know what you know an eating disorder is almost like this dissociation you kind of starve yourself out of yourself you don't feel your body and the breath brings you back into yourself um and you're sort of transcending a lot of like the drama and the mishigas of what you what you're dealing with but um it's both embodied and transcendent um and so i got really into kind of understanding breath and breath as a spiritual practice and again this was before i got into psychedelics it was really just seeing that everyone around me like had some sort of meditation practice um and how could i kind of use that for my own healing um and so you know, I'll say that breath is the sort of most, the most psychedelic thing of all. Um, you can get into a trip just through breath work. Uh, you can kind of breathe your way out of a, a tense moment in a psychedelic trip, a quote unquote bad trip. Um, you know, when people are having babies or like just breathe, you know, you go, you go through the breath one at a time and breathing itself, I like to say is sort of this reciprocal intercourse with God. Um, it's a giving and a receiving relationship. You know, you breathe, you breathe in and you give back. Um, so, and in Hebrew, um, you might be familiar with the tetragrammatron, the yud Vavhe, vav he, um, and those four letters, this, this is a name for God, Adonai. Um, the four letters are meant to pronounce the sound of a breath. Um, and relating it back also to um, Hinduism and Maharaji, who is a devotee of Hanuman or kind of embodied Hanuman in and of himself. Um, Hanuman, who was a messenger, um, the flying monkey, um, was said to be the breath of God, um, the breath of Ram. And so that was really kind of kindled my heart to sort of hear this relationship. Um, and Hanuman himself was also of service. And that was a really big thing with Maharaji too. So, um, you know, when, I, when we talk about meditation and breath work and you know, enlightenment and getting high, it's like, to what end, to what point, like, who cares? You know, like, are we actually going to make the world a better place by sitting on our meditation cushions and just, you know, like meditating our way out of war and fascism and all that's going on in the world? Um, and so I'll, I'll say, I'll say this. Um, first of all, like, when we do have a breathing practice, a mindfulness practice, um, we can see a little bit more clearly. And I think when we're, we're more awake, when our eyes are more open, um, then we're, we're seeing out both we're, we're working on ourselves and then we're also seeing outside ourselves. And when we're seeing outside ourselves, we see everything in the world that needs to be fixed. And then we therefore have a responsibility to work on that. Um, so, you know, I'll say also that exhalation especially um, activates the, the vagus nerve. And so, you know, that's again, something that is related to the parasympathetic, to the whole nervous system and activating parasympathetic state. And so we're kind of healing ourselves and then with the ability to kind of see out, out of ourselves and, and sort of heal the world. So there's a kind of um, relationship between individual and collective healing. Um, so I'll give a little bit of a story um, related to sort of Maharaji's own ethic of service. Uh, my dad, when he went to India, 
you know, he had retired from his law practice. He had been really successful. He was only 29 years old. And I think he was just ready to sort of be a hippie for the rest of his life and stay in India. And um, Maharaji said no and sent him back to America. And he said, you have a boon, you have a skill, and you it would you have a responsibility to be of service and to use that. And so I, the way I see it is that you would be kind of spitting on God's gifts, on what God gave you to not utilize it in, in, in service. So going back to sort of the psychedelic story here, um, what is the point of psychedelics, of tripping, if not to live a psychedelic life that kind of integrates um, the ethics, the values of psychedelics themselves, um, you know, you know, a life that sort of enables you to become more you, to kind of act that out in the world, to be your fullest self. And I really think that when we are our fullest selves, which psychedelics can help us become, and that really means when we're most in touch with our souls, um, it means that it's not even really about ourselves. It's outside the self. It's outside the ego. It's of the soul. And once we're able to really connect with that soul place, it engenders a sense of empathy. We talked about that a little bit in the mystical experience um, criteria. And it's through that that we can then be motivated, inspired to be of service, um, to do seva, so to speak. Um, and so I, I'd say that's also where the um, moral implication of religion comes in. So, you know, when we talk about how can we honor the divine or connect to the divine through psychedelics or through religion, I'll say that religion is a mindfulness practice and at, at its core and at its best. Um, it's an opportunity to create a container through sacred time and ritual. And it's within that um, that sp spirituality might occur. So we need sort of the grounded ritualistic elements um, or at least practices and disciplines in order to reach these spiritual heights, the framework um, that is the container. Um, I'll say it's even a set and setting. Um, but religion itself is not, religion is not a spiritual path in and of itself. And likewise, spirituality, psychedelic or otherwise, um, without a framework could be dangerous or lofty or without rigor um, and lack an ethical core that brings it down into reality, into actionable items that allow us to use that spirituality to inspire us to make the world, again, like a better place. And so, which I think honestly doing that sort of service, seva, tikkun olam, whatever the word you want to use, um, it was a way of, is an expression of honoring God or the divine or simply the connection and shared oneness with other living things, be it the people or nature or planet around us. So I guess that's what I want to end on is just at the core of psychedelics, religion, mysticism is really a code of ethics, um, I'd say a perennial ethic um, that I want to sort of leave as the um, as the ending point here. So thank you. And I'm excited for the questions. Wow. Thank you, Madison. That uh, I have so many things percolating in me that I want to talk to you about. Um, and I just so brilliantly tied together these different pieces uh, and so much wisdom. So thank you um, thank for bringing you. that to us to, this evening. Yeah. So for those of the, you watching, um, please type any questions that you have into your chat and then uh, Mon or, um, Gina will get them to me and I can ask Madison. Um, you know, as you were talking in the very beginning, um, it, you know, it felt like with everything that's going on in the world, the divisiveness, the pain, the lack of um, knowing what to do, um, and this feeling for, I think many of us, like um, a core, like how do we shift? How do we shift? And there's this, we have to somehow get beyond the mind that has created these problems, get beyond that ego um, sense, right? And uh, this, had, it feels like almost a silver bullet in some way, the way that you're describing it, right? Um, and I'm just curious if you have more to say about, about that. Yeah, I mean, I've I've seen like memes online or, or stuff that says like you can't get out of a problem with the same mentality that got you into the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of the beauty of psychedelic thinking is there are no there are no boundaries to it. Um, and, it, you know, by the very virtue of what it does in the brain neurogenesis, 
it's forming new connections all the time. Um, so I think it's really a consciousness shift and a paradigm shift. And, you know, I, and that sounds so simplistic, you know, it's like, we just need a paradigm shift and like the war will stop. Um, but, you know, I've written about this and I, again, it all sort of relates back to trauma. Mm. Um, I did a story on the role of PTSD in the Israel Palestine conflict and how that, um, basically the, this sort of perpetuation and clinging on to the traumatized narratives that then um, both other, like create this othering of both sides, of all sides. Um, and then it, it really like different parts of the brain. And I wish I had the signs in front of me, but like, especially for people who are 18 years old going to, to war and the idea for, you know, getting active, politically, you know, in the West Bank and Gaza, like the, those, your, your brain at the, at the age of 18 approximately is very malleable. And um, basically what I would love to see is that, you know, I don't think everyone is going to have access to psychedelics, obviously, or psychedelic healing, but I do think that we can take the values and the ethos of psychedelics and apply it to real world therapeutic techniques um, that can sort of work on, on the, the points of trauma that are behind and um, fueling the current political paradigms that we're in. Yeah, yeah. There's a the saying, and I, it it can be used, um, sort of thrown at people um, in a negative way. But I think really there's this compassionate thing of like when we're hurt, we hurt others, and when we're we've been abused, we often end up abusing others. Yeah. Um, Ex and this, what? Yeah, go, ahead. go ahead go ahead oh no i mean i just you know like i just want to say like it, it has real world implications in the way we vote um you know in the literal action in the actions that we take and so yeah what you're saying is like there is this kind of pattern of the the oppressed becoming the oppressors yeah um and this idea that that you're bringing up and i you know i read about this and how to change your mind right which i think is a lot of people have read is that that idea of the grooves that get put down in your brain um, the pathways. Um, and when you're like, as you're older, um, they're more set in that the taking a psychedelic is like um, fresh snow so that the down on the, so the tracks, you can make new tracks. And I love that as an analogy. Um, so it's yes. easier to change your mind. But I also love how you'd bring up this idea of, um, of, you know, not everyone's going to have access to psychedelics and not everybody, it's not everybody's medicines potentially. And this idea of breath, um, and you know, what came to mind was ro um, Ruha, right. Which is the word for breath, which can be translated at, you know, like as breath or Holy spirit or gravity or force or wind, which was the Hanuman, right. The breath of the, the um, and so I just love this idea that the breath has this power to be really psychedelic as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and to change our minds, to change our nervous systems, um, to, and to change the way we interact with each other. Um, it's just is such a powerful thing. Uh, and just learning how to breathe again, just learning how to breathe again can change so much, including um, how the uh, vagal nerve is mm -hmm. engaged. So do you either, like I know there's shamanic breath work and holotropic breath work, and then there's just like plain old learning pure breath, like a pure, do you have as far as the healing qualities versus the psychedelic qualities, anything else you want to say about how like, the breath can be used? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've guess I've struggled with, with it a lot. You know, I, as a kid, I had like even childhood asthma and then I, mm. I joined like a cross country team and I didn't think I could do it because of, I just didn't think I had the stamina for it. Um, and I mean, I just, what the technique that I've used, um, which is super basic, it was, I was in a 5-MeO, um, 5-MeO DMT is like a very intense form of DMT. The, the I was toe. being, yeah, the toad. Yeah, yeah. I was being guided and was freaking out. Um, even like, you're like not even there, you're not in yourself. And the guides were teaching me how to, re-teaching re me how to breathe. Um, and the technique that we used was like, three breaths in at the stomach. So really feel your stomach kind of go up and down and then do it from the chest. Mm -hmm. So ch like chest breathing and stomach breathing is a little bit different, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. I also learned 
and this, and again, this is all sort of my experiential learning. Like I've I've read about it in different books and stuff, but I've I've learned also where you in India this um, priest taught oh, yeah. you like cover all of the holes yeah. in your face, your ears, your nose, your, above your lip, below yeah. your lip. Oh, your eyes, sorry, your eyes, your nose, above your lip, <laughs> below your nose. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I think it's like through that um, sort of like nullification um, is again another, you know, another component of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I I guess I have a lot more to say on it, but I don't want to get too complicated. <laughs> yeah. There's one of the practices that has changed my life as far as turning on the parasympathetic nervous mm -hmm. system, like done a ton of holotropic breath, breath work, but, and it can get to these crazy psychedelic um, experiences. But the one that's actually integrated and changed my life the most is to lay on my belly for 12 minutes in the morning and 12 minutes at night mm. and just do a, like a full inhale and exhale where they're equal on both sides and they sort of melt into each other. If I do that, like my whole brain changes. It's wow. just like I'm, I'm more present. It's because the parent's sympathetic nervous system. Where did you learn off. that that belly breath technique? Um, I learned it through the uh, Himalayan Institute and, um, mm -hmm. and Rod Stryker. Cool. So, yeah. Cool. But it's really um, the Himalayan Institute has a lot on breath too. Mm -hmm. um, so what else did I want to ask you? There's, so there's some questions that are coming in. Um, can you talk about the different qualities, experiences, medical or spiritual healing that may be engendered by each of the psychedelics? Like which psychedelic is good for what indication? Yeah. So, okay. So right now MDMA is being studied. First of all, I'll say that any psychedelic could probably be used for any kind of indication and it's extremely subjective mm -hmm. um, and depends like on the set and setting, if there's a guide, what the intention is, like all of that. So I'll just point that out. Um, and they're often used for the same things or different things or whatever, but what they're being studied for MDMA specifically um, is being studied for PTSD. Um, and that's because the way that it sort of, the part of the brains that it activates and deactivates have to do with memory storage and also like oxytocin and feelings of love and safety and whatever. So you're basically able to revisit memories, put them into long-term storage while also having all of these love hormones flow through you. So it feels safer to sort of revisit these things and be in your body for, for that experience. Um, uh, psilocybin has been um, approved, you know, FDA approved studies are looking at psilocybin for depression. Um, and, you know, in other trials, it's also looking at um, anxiety, addiction. The psilocybin, I'd say really is the most, um, popular right now in all of the psychedelic research. Mm -hmm. Um, but like the, you know, there's even Ibogaine, um, which is a very long, intense, uh, plant medicine from West Africa. That's often used to sort of cut, um, opioid addiction, like mm -hmm. nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. So you go through like a very intense Ibogaine, um, trial and then have an integration and a lot of people are able to sort of stay, um, you know, stay with having broken off that cycle. Mm -hmm. um, what else can I tell you? But yeah, the, ma the main things really, you know, there's, there's even research right now where people are creating novel psychedelic compounds. So compounds that look at that, that work on like the serotonin receptors, which is sort mm -hmm. of what we know about psychedelics, like mm -hmm. very little is actually known about the way psychedelics work in the brain. You know, what I, I forgot to mention during the talk was that, you know, I, I talked about ego death. That's because the default mode network is, um, activity in the default mode network is decreased under a psychedelic experience, meaning that that is the seat of um, the ego. And therefore we're able to re you know, when that's dampened, we can sort of create new patterns, break old patterns. It's someone once equated it to like mowing the lawn and just like setting new paths. Um, and then of course, when you're off the psychedelic, um, the, the grass grows back in a sort of different way, different patterning. Um, uh, what else can I tell you? Um, so, you know, I, yeah, um, also, okay, so these novel psychedelic compounds, um, people are using them especially, or looking at them especially um, for the treatment of physical um, ailments. Mm. So pain relief, things like that. Again, it's really, yeah, I encourage you to visit Double Blind. Um, it's my magazine just because there's, 
there's so much going on. It's almost it's impossible to keep track, but we we do our best. So okay. that's great. Yeah. So yeah. I'm curious um, with psilocybin and a lot of the you know your thoughts on microdosing versus megadoses. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's funny. Like you talk to sort of the old the heads, the old heads, and they're like microdosing just means you didn't take enough. Um, and I have really complicated views on microdosing. First of all, you know, anecdotal evidence and some clinical evidence, you know, like it, it does help people. If that's placebo, that's up for debate. But if it's helping people, great. Like, why not? Um, I guess what concerns me is that, you know, we've heard about this whole like microdosing phenomenon in Silicon Valley and how microdosing just like helps you be better at um, capitalism. Mm. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, isn't that missing the point a little bit? Yeah. And so, you know, I want to encourage people to, you know, mindfully incorporate and use psychedelics for, you know, self, self-improvement, self better, you know, betterment or whatever. But I also, so there's two approaches here. You know, there's when people say I want to try psychedelics, I'm completely naive. I've never done this before. Some, there's one school of thought that would be like, okay, we'll start with a microdosing or start with a low dose. and then the other school of thought is, you know, I started out with like um, more than an eighth of mushrooms, which is a pretty intense dose. Um, and once you kind of have that experience, then when you start microdosing, you at least know what it's channeling. Yeah. You know, it's like you're getting the stream, but you know it's coming from this big river. And again, that's that's really the opportunity to sort of paradigm shift, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I like to say that psych- microdosing is basically like the CBD of psychedelics. Like, can you say you've tried weed that you've gotten high on cannabis if you've just tried CBD? No, but it has its benefits for sure. So, yeah, I like that. I like the, the stream analogy as well. That's very yeah. helpful. Um, would you talk also a little bit more about uh, set and setting and having guides versus not having guides and um, yeah, that, so- that aspect of it? So yeah, so for those who don't know, set and setting is this term actually that uh, Albert and Leary and others at Harvard um, developed and that it's the idea that you, um, there's both your mental state going into a psychedelic trip and then of course your environment and your surroundings. Um, And so this is gonna determine your trip. Um, You know, a psychedelic, all it really does is magnifies what's already going on. So if you're going in, you know, I, I used to have this feeling that, that um, you know, I had to be like in this perfect mental state in order to take psychedelics. Cause like, I didn't want to, to deal, I didn't want stuff to come up that was gonna be uncomfortable. And then the more I studied it and researched it, I said, well, isn't that kind also part of the point? Like, you know, people are going into it with really intense depression and anxiety <laughs> trying to work on that. So I think, really what's integral as much as set and setting is really your intention. Um, What are you trying to get out of it? Um, You know, partially when you talk about working with a guide or not working with a guide, especially for um, either like people who are newer to psychedelics or somebody who wants to go really deep. Obviously, you don't, you want to just know that someone, you want to feel held, um, not isolated, have someone to, you know, quote unquote, hold space for you if you need help. So I think even even if you don't actually end up needing that help, knowing that support is available can com- completely alter the trip itself. Um, you know, and then there's the question of whether you want to do it in a ceremonial setting um, or do it at a concert um, and both everything or in, with a therapist, you know, in a clinical trial or um, whatever it is, all are legitimate. And I really want to break down this feeling of this, this hierarchy of, mm. oh, well, like the Western clinics are the, the gold standard because these are Johns Hopkins scientists supervising you. And like this underground guide uh, who you met in Boulder is less, um, you know, is less legit. And that's all, that's just, that's not true. You know, like there, this is really, you know, and I saw this in cannabis, you know, as cannabis went legal, there was sort of this lack of honor for the people who really built the cannabis industry who put their freedom and reputation and lives on the line to really get cannabis to where it was to only then be co-opted by you know like the sterilized like white guys in suits pretty much um making it more mainstream and so i 
psychedelics are kind of going through a similar process. So I really encourage people to like keep it weird and like lean into the weirdness so long as it feels safe and supported and, you know, just like attuned to like what you personally need. That's great. So this is, it's maybe a little off topic, mm -hmm. but um, what you said just sort of led into this, like maybe it's a shadow side of the, the Renaissance of, um, and there's the two things that come up as the sustainability of some of the plants that are used as well as the, like these indigenous tr uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk into, and you know, often being taken and then um, by various people and charge lots of money and the money not going back to the, the tribes. Can you, yeah, yeah talk it's, a, it's an issue, that? that's an yeah, issue. Yeah. Um, so there's this, um, you know, this concept of like, co the concept of sacred reciprocity that really my, my co-founder Shelby at Double Blind really she, this is like her favorite topic, one of her favorite topics. Um, so I'm going to channel that a little bit. But, and that's because she has a very strong relationship with ayahuasca. Um, but essentially, you know, first of all, there's a lot of non indigenous uh, space holders out there, medicine facilitators. That sh I don't know if I want to use the word shaman, whatever. That, and that's fine. And, you know, like I see it in all different spaces. And, you know, it's encouraged to an extent, but really then you have to ask that person, like, what is their relationship to an indigenous tradition? Like how well versed, studied, experienced are they with the, the derivative, the root of what they're, they're, what they're bringing to, you know, this American audience or, you know, group of participants or whatever. Of course, then the second question is, is yeah, like people have said that ayahuasca vine itself herself has this agenda to sort of like spread throughout the world like this is the you know a word on the streets so right speak. right absolutely yeah um and that brings with it like you know questions of well okay then that does is the ayahuasca tourism itself making um making it at risk of being endangered um so i think the idea is like to really vet your like vet your guide um if you're going to a retreat center vet them um, you know, at Double Blind, we have resources to help you with this vetting process um, to know, like, you know, are the proceeds going back to an indigenous tribe? Like, to what what is the relationship between, you know, the newcomers to the space and um, the stewards of the plant medicine itself? So I think it's really just an interrogation. But I'd say if there's no relationship whatsoever, like, that is a red flag. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So Andy asks, do you have any recommendations, books or courses, resources um, on this particular combination of subject, psychedelics, mysticism and religion? Yeah, so I'll say um, a book that's like really changing my life is called Magic of the Ordinary. Mm. And it's by Gershon Winkler. Um, and it's such a psychedelic book. And I interviewed Gershon and he's like never touched a psychedelic. So... <laughs> Um, so really recommend that. Um, I'm like looking at my bookshelf here. I mean, I obviously like the, the classics, like I would recommend Rick Strassman. Um, that's a really heavy read, but it's worth just like even perusing his books, just like for the, like the main, the main meat on the bones, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, what the question is for all, for all of the above or yeah, for the three things that you sort of brilliantly brought together today um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually writing a book right now so oh, good so good. yeah that'll that'll be part of it um I mean as far as like you know there's another book I mean I don't know if he's like talking about like specifically Jewish books also but there's a book um called the Sabbath um by Heschel Abraham Heschel and he oh, nice. again that's like a soup really again got me thinking about Jewish concepts specifically Shabbat um as a site like a psychedelic like this ultimate day of be here now almost and mm -hmm. that being a set and setting a container to have an altered experience and the way he classifies it is as this palace in time and so really gets you out of the mundane time and puts you into psychedelic time sacred psychedelic time and I've learned through my own shop as practice to be able to discipline my mind in a way um, to sort of enter into like this 
Shabbat state that feels psychedelic and that's completely mm. sober, you know, sober. Like once, once I'm in, once I'm in it, I can do what I want. Um, and often if I am going to trip, I want to do it on Shabbos because like you're already kind of in a good zone. Um, so that again is like part of the set and setting. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's also like the Jew and the Lotus. Um, I should put together like a whole reading list. I'm like thinking off the top of my head and looking at my books behind me. So you've, um, you've given about us four so far. So yeah. I think those are, that's a good start. We gave one yeah. earlier. Oh, and then these also, three. Also, Aldous Huxley, I know that's so basic, but reading reading him like changed my life. You know, uh, same here, Island. Change, that, that was the I like it was like because one of the reasons I loved it so much is because of the integration it was like we the the thing that came through so often is you know we do psychedelics on special occasions and the rest of the time we meditate it's like you have a feast once in a while and the rest of the time you just eat small meals and to me that was like such a brilliant way of bringing those two things together yeah I, I was just gonna say island is like the story version of the doors of perception and it's like this is what like a psychedelic life utopia sort of looks like and not everything is going to be utopia utopia but like how can we at least try to channel these practices and island is just a beautiful story so yeah, yeah. so it actually brings me uh back to um you know i look around in communities um specifically a lot of the um, ayahuasca communities and I, I almost at times it almost seems like instead of moving away from addiction it's moving in a similar pathway of addiction mm. um and maybe that's just my outside per perception of things um or like a lack of integration of some of the things um would you be willing to speak into that at all right by addiction do you mean just people doing it all the time and like a, like just like i guess chasing the high instead of integrating yeah. You know, it's funny because people call it like the medicine, right? And it's like, okay, you take medicine when you're sick. And then when you're mm -hmm. not sick, you don't need to take medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that you can't take a psychedelic. For, you know, there's this idea of psychedelics for the betterment of well people. Um, I think Bob Jesse, I, I don't want to misquote him or if that's who it is. But anyways, um, the, so there's that idea too. But I see this all the time, like people just constantly going to ceremony and their lives not really looking different, like over the years, like how, are, and, and again, it's not for, for me or anyone to judge what, what could be an internal shift. Um, but, you know, when I ask myself, like, what is a psychedelic life? It's not going to ceremony every so often or all the time or whatever, or doing acid all the time or on camping trips every week or whatever it is. It's like, what does your life look like in between mm -hmm. the psychedelic states? And so, and, and I ask myself, what is the point, if not to feel different, to, to act differently when you're sober? Um, and again, for me, a, a, a regular yoga practice four times, five times a week has been more transformative than any acid trip I've been on. Um, and, you know, whatever the practices are that you connect with, whether that's dance or yoga or meditation, and really it's it's about flow state and like that's a lot of when I interview people on set and setting you know I'm asking them like what is how do you be here now like what's your way of doing that how do you get into flow state um and psychedelics I think show us what that feels like in a really magnified way but it's 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 our responsibility to harness that and integrate it incorporate it into our daily mundane lives I think in the beginning you talked about um the man you interviewed who had helped him actually understand religion. I would say similar, um, like even yogic states, like, like a, it's like, Oh, this is why I've been meditating all the, these years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, earlier you were talking about how, and you sort of brought it around just now this, like how it changes, it can uh, change your life. And, one of the questions that come up very often in sort of these yogic Hindu, you know, American Hindu um, settings is like dharma, this idea of dharma. We're doing a course on the Bhagavad Gita coming up, um, finding harmony in daily life. And one of the topics is dharma. And people are constantly like, what's my dharma? What's my dharma? What, what is my duty in the world? Um, often thinking it's vocation, but like dharma being something bigger. And the answer is often like, you have to listen really closely. You know, like you have to get still and you have to listen. And it feels like, um, like psychedelics 
could be one of those really brilliant ways of learning how to do that tuning in and learning how to do that listening and learning like how we um, begin to have a shift in the collective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's really about getting in touch with your soul, like really like, and if, if maybe if nothing else, if, if used in the right set and setting, like psychedelics can be a microphone for the soul um, mm. and the soul being like the, the conductor of a dharmic path. Right. You know, and you, I, you know, in, in Hebrew, I would use the word derech, which just really means path, but I feel like it means soul path. Mm. Um, and it's very similar to Dharma in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, for, I don't, I forgot what the question is or what, what is the question exactly here, but like, I think ultimately, like we think because of the way, you know, our economic system and capitalism is set up that like, you're defined by the work that you do in the world. The thing that you do to make money is like who you are, what you do, whatever. And, you know, I think what, what is a psychedelic life is actually bringing balance to that is like seeing your your vocation your the, your work as you know your service outside yourself but also seeing you know seeing yourself as as a parent as a sister as a friend as someone who likes to go dancing you know as mm -hmm. like someone who just can walk around in nature and so that i think is it, it's taken a lot of psychedelic work on my part to be able to value a hike as much as I value getting an entire article done. Yeah. Um, so, and to, and to put that almost at equal places in my life. And really it's, it's been, it's been really a lot of work and a lot of practice. Um, I'm still working on it, but yeah. It's always right. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Stephen that's come in and then we're going to need to wrap up here in a, in a few minutes, but um, he asks, do you have any thoughts, theoretical or personal, on the value of music for psychedelic experiences, considering your theme and thoughts on religion or meditation, meditative music. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, yes, I do have thoughts. First of all, where it kind of can, can go in all different directions for this. Um, there's an episode. The first episode of Set and Setting is with Justin Beretta, and the whole episode is sort of like on music and like you know music for psychedelic experience. It's number one. Number two, in the psychedelic trials, um, people have these playlists and oftentimes it's instrumental, classical, nonverbal is the point. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some there's actually been criticism because it's a lot of like Western classical music and like, why couldn't it be like African drumming or something like that? So, you know, I think it really depends on like what your orientation is, like um, culturally, uh, what your tastes are, whatever, that will indicate like what kind of music you want um, to be part of your experience. Um, you know, and I think it depends on the kind of experience you're trying to have. Like if you're trying to go deep, have an intention, really look into like addiction or depression or something serious, maybe better not to have um, words in the songs. Um, if you're trying to have fun or calm down, you know, like I've, you know, tripped and listened to Krishna Das and the Grateful Dead and you know, electronic music, you know, just like fun stuff, you know, it really changes the vibe. And then of course, there's the whole question of, um, in ceremony, you know, specific to like ayahuasca, maybe even mushrooms, they have Icaros, which are like the um, native um, wordless melodies, or not wordless, but like different kind of humming and uh, sounds that you make with the mouth, um, which are meant that, that are the medicine as much as the actual ayahuasca itself. You know, the whole trip is really influenced by by the music that accompanies it. And I've sat in ayahuasca settings where people were singing naganam, which are sort of old um, Jewish uh, wordless melodies um, or songs, that, not always wordless, but kind of just um, songs of like my own ancestry. And that's been super resonant. So, um, you know, with sensitivities to sort of like cultural appropriation and kind of blending of cultural traditions between Icaros and like where you're coming from. Like, I think it's both really interesting to look into like the music of your own ancestry, um, but also like the music of that, you know, uh, traditionally goes with the thing that you're doing. Um, if there is like a lineage and a stewardship of, of, around it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love all those pieces. Um, and just a little plug, you know, John Hopkins came out with a psychedelic playlist, and there's one on there with East Forest um, who loops in some Ram Dass tracks. So um, just FYI, little plug. <laughs> yeah, I heard um, about that, actually. Yeah. Let's see. There, uh, there's another question that came from YouTube. I've been interested in the gentle art of introducing others to the peace that can be found in the present moment. And then they ask, can you tell us more about the breathing exercises you were excited to share? Um, yeah, so the, really what transformed my relationship to wanting to really learn more about breathing, at least as an adult, um, was this, I don't, know, I don't know if this technique has a name, but really it's three breaths focused on the stomach. Like you lay down, laying down, your, your legs can be bent and like put your hands on your stomach and just three breaths in and then three breaths in and out through the stomach and then three breaths in and out from the chest and do that three in a cycle of at least three times. That was like, got me through a five MEO trip and really changed things for me. And again, I was able to heart like from doing it under the influence of the psychedelic and then doing it in my regular life because it, there was like that shared, that was the, the common thing that really changed things for me. Um, you know, I've tried holotropic breathing before. It's, it's hard. It's really, it's hard to do physically. Um, and so like, I can't say I'm specifically advanced in it. Um, so um what sorry what's what's the question exactly again that was basically it um, okay well, what was the the breathing exercises you're excited yeah sure. i'm excited about the three the the stomach and the chest one yeah that's, mm -hmm. that's good and then lastly we have the question of what's your star sign um i'm a gemini <laughs> <laughs> uh a leo moon <laughs> virgo rising <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, this is such an incredibly rich topic, and I really have just appreciated your wisdom, um, understanding, knowledge, experience, um, and the the mystical aspect of it. I'm also really excited about the studies that you mentioned. Um, I love, you know, it ran, reminds me of the Good Friday experiment. Yeah, it's kind of a reincarnation of that, I'll say. Yeah, if, if you, you want to explain <laughs> that, and for those who might not know what the Good Friday yeah, was. So that was um, uh, back, in, it's the 60s, I, I guess. I like, so. I don't, yeah. I don't know the exact date. Where they gave um, psilocybin to um, a student, what, what's, what's divinity. the Divinity. Divinity, divinity yeah, divinity yeah. students. And it was basically, Harvard, and there was a Good Friday sermon going on at the same time, and they were sort of channeling or like streaming the, the sermon that was going on upstairs at, the, at Marsh Chapel in Boston, downstairs for the students. You know, and you know, reports years later are showing like how um, significant this was for them. And so, the, the format is different, of course. <laughs> Instead of a bunch of divinity students kind of just hanging out in the, the basement of Marsh Chapel, now it's you know with eye eye folds, and you're with yeah. two therapists, you know, with John at Johns Hopkins or you know other study sites, um, one on one. So it's a little bit different, but yeah. same yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. What I love, they I, apparently they gave um, the control group niacin, which gives you a flush. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't like decades later when they interviewed them, like they didn't have the, this experience, like their connection was different than those than who had been given the psilocybin. Yeah. The mystical experience was exactly. Yeah. 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 And I think that really speaks to, you know, in this case, the non placebo effect. Yeah. 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 Well, we have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, this has been, again, such a rich, rich, rich conversation. Thank you so much for uh, being here and being a part of it. Um, yeah. I want everyone here to know, as well as you, that there'll be a replay, um, a link for the replay so you can share it with friends or rewatch it. Um, and if you, you know, we give all of these away for free. Um, if you want to support events like this, you can text Satsang, S-A-T-S-A-N-G, to 9199, or there'll be a link in your chats. Um, we also invite you to sign up at ramdas.org slash fellowship so you can find out about all of the events that are going on throughout each month. And if you're interested in that six-week course on finding harmony in today's world, the mystical um, wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, 
Uh, there's a few more days to sign up. So go to ramdas.org slash Gita course. Um, just want to give you a big thank you again. Um, what are some things coming up for you? I want um, people to know about. Yeah, first of all, really thank you so much for, for having me here. It's just been, it's been so fun even just putting this presentation together. Um, some things coming up. I, um, so I double blind is the mag, the psychedelic magazine that I co-founded. Um, we have our print issue coming out, uh, this early this summer, late spring. So it comes out twice a year. Um, we also have in-person events finally that we're planning. So just really stay tuned for, um, you know, stay tuned at double blind at double blind mag, um, for everything that we're doing. We have a summit, um, we have educational courses. Um, planning a summit actually on trauma. Um, yeah, and we're going to be doing a music festival over the summer. Um, and then for me personally, I um, am working on a book. So just keep keep following me, and you'll one day find out about when that's coming out. Um, that's I'm at Madison Margolin on Instagram or on Twitter. It's Margolin Madison, and then you can also kind of find me on Facebook, and most of it's public. Um, and I have a column uh, with Ion Press, um, which is a new sort of Jewish literary outlet um, called Speaking from Experience. And it's really an interview series uh, with people all about everything we just talked about, Jewish, psychedelic, earth-based, all of that, all of that stuff. Um, and yeah, just, you know, I would say follow, follow along with me. And I, I have a lot of cool projects um, in the works that will be revealed when the time is right. <laughs> I'll definitely be follow, following yes. along and I'm really excited for your book. Thank you. um, uh, yeah. So Duncan Trussell will be here with us next month, which we're really excited about. And um, we'll just, let's give a big thanks both to Madison as well as to the behind the scenes folks, JR, Gina, everyone that helps to make tonight happen. And again, all of you for showing up and being here and deepening into these topics with wisdom keepers of our time. So thank you again. Be well. Yeah.